Um, hi everyone. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here again. I love coming to summer school and I know I recognize faces in the audience here. I know some of you have been with me on this journey several times. This time it's slightly different. This time I'm going to talk about the curious lives of the Thunderbirds and their relatives. Now some of you may wonder what are the Thunderbirds and what is my interest in the Thunderbirds, but I'm going to get there. I just want to say that you know, as a paleontologist, I work on many different kinds of animals. And as Madi just explained, my research involves the microscopic structure of the bones of these extinct animals. And so my research involves many, many different kinds of animals. If they have bones, I can work on them. Whether they're humans, extinct humans, or early humans, whether they're modern humans like us, or whether they um, a vertebrate, like a, an early vertebrate, like a fish or maybe an amphibian, anything that has bones, I work on. And what's happened over the past, I would say, decade or so, I think people have realized the contribution that bone microstructure can make to understanding the biology of extinct animals. So normally, when we find fossils, in extinct animals, we find them, we study their bones, we get an idea about the size they are, their, their anatomy tells us something about how they moved. But if we want to know something about how they lived, what was their biology like, then we have to look at the microscopic structure of their bones. And so my interest in these big birds actually started about two years ago. And I was contacted by a researcher in France who was working on a big bird. I will tell you about that one in a while. And this particular bird was a large bird on an island. 
and it had very, very unusual um, size for, for a bird, and I was asked to look at its bone microstructure. And since then, I've now looked at several other birds. And the ones that have really been absolutely fascinating for me have been these thunderbirds. And I thought what I'm going to do in the next two lectures is share with you some of the research that I've been doing. But the first thing we have to do is introduce the birds. So that's why this lecture is meet these birds, meet the giant birds. Okay. So, when we look at modern birds, the largest modern bird is an ostrich. And you've all seen ostriches. You know that the males can be incredibly tall, about 2.8 meters. And some of them reach about 156 kilograms. That's the largest living bird. And it's terrestrial. In the marine realm, of course, we have the emperor penguin. And we know that it's not very tall, just over a meter and reaches about 46 kilograms. What about flying birds? Flying birds, it's either the wandering albatross or the royal albatross. Different sources will tell you one or the other is larger. But these are big birds. They have wingspans of about 3.5 meters. This is what we have in the modern realm in terms of big birds. In the fossil record, it's a completely different story. Until 2013, Argent Avis was considered to be the largest bird known in the fossil record. It had a wingspan that certainly exceeded the uh, wandering and royal albatrosses. It had about five meter wingspan. It was known particularly in Argentina. That's where its name comes from. It's actually the magnificent bird from Argentina. That's what its name means. Okay? And it dates to about 6 million years old. And estimates suggest that it was probably about 60 to 80 kilograms in body weight. So quite a biggish bird. And from the skeletal elements that were found, it seems to be similar to a modern vulture. But that was not the biggest. So can I just really ask, how heavy is um, the royal albatross or the wandering albatross? A, a much lighter, so probably like about 40 kilos at the very most. OK. In 2014, this bird was described. And it has this name, Pelagornus sandersi. And the Pelagornithids are these large flying birds. And I just hinted that there's more than one of them known. So they're different species. And they are these really giant birds that we know of in the fossil record. Their wingspan is about 6.4 meters. So really quite enormous. And we know that this particular bird was actually found in South Carolina in 1983. And for all that time, it just sat in the collections. Nobody studied their bones. And then there was a young uh, New Zealand um, ornithologist who decided to visit these collections. And he pulled out these boxes. And he realized that he had this extremely large bird. And so it was only described in 2014. This animal is really quite enormous. Here it is. Sorry, this, I couldn't get a better slide, but it's just one that shows the dimensions compared to other big birds. So here you see it compared to an albatross, compared to an Andean condor with a wingspan of 3.2 meters, a pelican 3 meters, and then, of course, the golden eagles and ospreys much smaller. So they were really very, very big. And here's some of the fossils of this bird that's known. So we have a fair amount. Huh? Sorry, can we turn the lights down a little bit? Can we do that? We, oh, probably here. Yeah. So maybe in the audience? Way, like in the middle. I think in the middle. Yeah. So, so, so. Does that help? When, that should be a there should be a dimmer switch. Does that become better? 
And these ones here, this is the ones that have to come off. I think whole lights here, this one. No, but that one's okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So this uh, Pelagornus um, sanderici is known by several bones in its skeleton. You can see these are some of the bones that we have of its skeleton. And these strange looking bones here are actually part of its skull. So this is the skull of this bird. They're very, very slender. And what should immediately strike you is that they had teeth in their jaws which modern birds don't have. But I have news for you. Those teeth are not real teeth. They're not made of dentine and enamel. Okay? They're what we call pseudo-teeth. Now, for those of you that probably attended my lectures on the evolution of birds, you know that along the evolution of birds, we know that birds started with an ancestor, a dinosaur ancestor, that had teeth. But along the evolutionary history, birds lose their dentition. And that's why we have modern birds without teeth. But these guys develop different kinds of teeth. And what they have are these pseudo teeth. And these, these pointy structures, are actually outgrowths of their mandible and maxilla. So the actual jaw bones grow out and form these structures. And so, one of my, I didn't do the analysis. I was trying to get some of these teeth, but I wasn't, I wasn't able to. Somebody beat me to it. And the person who got it did the analysis on those teeth, and he showed very clearly that they are made up of bone. So just like you have bones with bone cells and blood vessels and all these things, these teeth are the same. And so, these birds are known as the Pelagornithids, and they are a group of them that have these um, zero teeth in their jaws. That is the most distinctive feature about them. And there are a couple of big ones. Here's another Pelagornithid. This one, as its name suggests, comes from Chile. Okay? And we know that it's, it's not as large as the Sanderacy one but it also has a wingspan of, a wingspan of more than five meters. And this one, we know certainly also from the fossil record, dates to about five to 10 million years ago. And with those teeth, we think that they probably were piscivores, that they would swim ab above the ocean and fish like the pterosaurs did. Many of the pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, also had a whole array of teeth in their jaws, which they also used to catch fish. And we think that this arrangement of the teeth in their jaws would have facilitated that kind of lifestyle. So talking of pterosaurs, here's the largest pterosaur known. Look at its wingspan, 11 meters wingspan. It's like a small airplane, really enormous. But they are not birds. They are cousins of birds, and they're cousins of dinosaurs. They had, this Quetzalcoatlus had the largest wingspan of any animal known. And even that large animal, also, we have many, many fossils of that Quetzalcoatlus. And compared to this animal, we see Pelagornis is the next largest animal that we know of that flew. And one of the big, big questions is, how did these giants actually take off? Once they're airborne, we can understand that they probably used the air currents to move. They probably were using the kind of wind that, that was around at the time to help them fly. But from the ground, how do they take off? And there have been several, several hypotheses. Currently, what people think for the Quetzalcoatlus is that they probably, so this animal, just imagine, hey, a wingspan of 11 meters and as tall as a giraffe. So they have, there are images, I didn't put one here, but they really were enormous. How did this animal take off? And there have been suggestions that these very large birds and flying animals, I should say, 
may have used cliff sides to actually take off and land, that basically use the height of a cliff to actually take off. There have also been suggestions, and this is actually from um, some uh, a person who is actually a physicist, and he studied the biomechanics of Quetzalcoatlus, and he suggests that they may have been able to jump to start. So normally birds, even if you look at pigeons, you'll see that when they take off, they have a little sprint and then they take off. And he's, this guy who was a physicist, he seems to suggest that they may have actually jumped to be able to at least get that first um, step up. Once they are up, they can flap their wings and they'll be able to fly. But again, it's still, I think it's still one of those topics that we can never be 100% sure. It's really difficult to understand how do they do it. Even if you look at albatrosses, they actually, it's really difficult for them to take off. And especially if it's windy, it's really quite tricky. So that's actually the most energy consumed for a flying vertebrate is when they actually take off. Being in the air is not so energetically costly. It's actually the takeoff that is very, very costly. So who are these thunderbirds? Well, I thought if I actually call the lecture The Curious Lies of the Mirangs, nobody's going to come to the lecture. <laughs> So I decided to rather call them by their popular name, the Thunderbirds. So in South Africa, you probably never heard of the Thunderbirds. But in Australia, everybody knows the Thunderbirds because they were endemic to Australia. They were these huge birds. Actually, the name Mirangs actually comes from the Taipurang people who call them the giant bird. So that mirrors actually is an Aboriginal word. And they were certainly very, very prevalent all over Australia. And sadly, none of them are around today. All of them are extinct, but I'll come to that. So these giant birds are the mirrors or the thunderbirds. And I've really been so privileged to be able to work on this group. So currently, I have, I've published on them. Just last year, we had a paper that came out on the Mirangs. That's when Madi contacted me and said, please, won't I come and talk to you people about my research on these birds? And I'm currently involved in other research on these Mirangs. So tomorrow, I'm going to tell you a lot more about them. But today, just to introduce them, they were these big birds from Australia. And they're also known as the dromornithids. Okay, so they are very uh, well-known birds. And we know that they were very good runners because we have many, many skeletal elements. Tomorrow I'm going to show you lots of pictures of their skeletons. They have, had big, powerful limbs. They were fast runners. And they had these skulls that were really quite big and deep. And when people first saw these big skulls, they thought they were probably predatory birds. But there's nothing about them that suggests that they were predators. And, and I'll show you pictures just now about the real predators of the Cenozoic. But here we know that these birds had this big, uh, powerful jaw. And we think that they may have just used them to eat the, uh, plants that were very tough. So basically, just to crush and grind plant matter. So they are known from 8 million years ago right up to 30,000 years ago. So relatively recently extinct. And what is also interesting about them is that they are such a big group of birds. There are many, many different kinds of these dromornithids or thunderbirds known. And we know that. In the evolution of these birds themselves, they changed. So there, was, there were changes. Some of them became lighter. Some of them became more specialized in their diet. But as a group, all of them were endemic to Australia, not even in New Zealand. New Zealand, and I will tell you in the next few minutes about New Zealand birds, New Zealand had their own big birds. But Australia's fauna are these thunderbirds, very different from the moa of New Zealand. And 
the, so, so I've published on the Dromornithids, and currently I'm working on this Genionis, which was one of the most recent of these Dromornis birds that we, we know of. So they were very large. Here you see the bird compared to a camel, okay? Enormous bird, three meters tall, and our recent estimates of the males of the species is about 650 kilograms. So really, really big, heavy birds. And the Dromornis we know, we find in the fossil record from about eight million years ago, and some, some indications maybe even in the Miocene already. And this is where they mainly found, in the central part of Australia, in the Northern Territory, in Alcoota. So if you've been to Alice Springs, I don't know how many of you have been to Alice Springs, but um, last year I was invited as a keynote speaker to a conference in Alice Springs. And I had never been to Australia. Uh, because I was working on these birds, I'd never been to Australia, and the next minute I get this invitation to come and speak at a conference in Alice Springs. And most people have never heard of Alice Springs. But it was one of the most amazing places. So I flew into Adelaide, and I spent some time at Flinders University. That's the very big paleontological university where they do paleontology. And from there, we drove all the way into the heart of the country. It was the most amazing journey. And I always thought to myself, why did I never go to Australia before? It has fascinating animals, and it was just wonderful. It, in terms of biodiversity, it's as rich as South Africa and Africa. It's really amazing. And I was so fortunate to be traveling with biologists because we stopped at various places, and nobody minded if we stopped at a water hole and looked at animals for two hours and then continued. So it was wonderful. The fossils, all these Dromornithid fossils, have been collected from mainly from Alcoota. They think there was probably a large water hole in the area. And the fossils are now located in the Alice Springs Museum. And that's why the meeting was there, and that's why I was there speaking about these birds. And would you believe we have such good information about them that we know who's their closest relatives and who would think that they have a duck or a goose as their closest relatives. So we'll come back to this question about why is it that these birds get so big? But just again for you to remember that this is their relatives are really quite ordinary medium-sized birds. Not, not very small, but not very big either. But on the island, they be, Australia, they become huge. What about the elephant bird? I'm sure you've heard about Apionis. And Apionis, until very, very recently, it was considered to be the largest terrestrial bird. But now we know that the Thunderbirds are even larger. And certainly, Apionis competes quite well for the title. They reach about 500 kilograms, really very large birds. And they, of course, are much closer to home. They are from Madagascar. And they are related quite closely to the Retites, which are the ostriches, the emus, and the cassowaries, those large terrestrial birds. But today, we've been able to do uh, DNA analysis on these bones, and we know that their closest ancestors are actually kiwis. And I, my next slide actually is a kiwi. But I just want to say that they were around, we think, right up to the 17th century. There are reports of sailors seeing large birds like this. So they've only gone extinct relatively recently and mainly we think by humans, or because of humans. So from Madagascar, they were these very large birds. The largest of them is the Epionis maximus, but there were at least three other kinds of Epionis. And some people even think that maybe the smaller ones are actually another bird called Malaronis. 
but the biggest of them is Apionis. So Apionis was this very large retite, ostrich relative on Madagascar. And there's its eggs for comparison. A hummingbird egg in the hands of this person, an ostrich egg, and an Apionis egg. It was huge. And we know from the very few eggs that survive, there's just about three eggs that are known, and they were so large that we think they had a seven liter volume. So if people found these eggs, they would be able to feed a family. At least 10 people could eat from those eggs at one time. So really very, very large eggs. And maybe that's why they were exploited so much. It was very easy to get the eggs. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Fazile. So these are notes that you have. You can each take one, so you don't have to be writing uh, very fast as I'm speaking. OK, so it's the largest egg that is known. and I, and. So most of you know that I also work on dinosaurs, and I can also tell you it's also one of the largest eggs that we know for any vertebrate. The only eggs that are bigger than this are eggs of a dinosaur called, uh, well, the egg is called um, a, a ulitus ziziensis, or a large egg about 44 centimeters long, which belongs to a sauropod dinosaur. But otherwise, this egg is one of the largest eggs known for any, um, any, any vertebrate. And here's an egg being held by David Attenborough. I just thought you, you'd get an idea about how big it is if you see him there. And in fact, I should tell you, he has one of the eggs in his private collection. So he has, um, he's one of the holders of these big Epionis eggs. So this is its relative. So genetic um, analysis suggests that the smallest of the ratites, the kiwi, so, so you probably all know that the kiwi is also related to ostriches and emus, but it's the smallest of them. And the smallest ratite is the closest relative of the largest of the ratites that we know of. And that is really quite something. Because we, we can see in terms of habits, it's also um, not a, a carnivore, it's a herbivore. And we see in terms of the, the way in which the animal is um, kind of adapted to its lifestyle, it, it's a large animal, it's slow moving, it's not really a fast runner. And being so big, it wouldn't be a fast runner. And so how did this actually happen? And there's, of course, many suggestions about the biogeography of uh, the, how biogeography and continental drift would have facilitated the movement of these birds. And the suggestion originally, first I should tell you, is that we think that the ratites originally emerged in South America. And then they made their way across through Gondwana land, we think that they were able to cross over and then move to Africa and from Africa to um, Australia. Okay, so we think that they may have actually been able to do uh, that kind of movement. But we know that if we think about when Gondwana broke up, we know that it must have been a flying bird that was able to make that movement that the ancestors of the ratites must have been able to fly, because then they would be able to cross these big ocean spaces, even though we know that the earliest ancestors are found in South America. We also know that these, the, in the fossil record, they are these paleognathus birds, the group to which ostriches and emus and all these ratites belong, and they were certainly capable of flight. So they became flightless on these continents that they eventually landed on. So the ancestor of these large terrestrial birds was actually capable of flight. And we think that 
certainly these birds became extinct because of humans hunting them and changing the habitats, destroying the habitats. And we also think that the eggs were collected for uh, food as well. And it seems there is clear archaeological evidence of butchering on some of the bones of these Epionus birds as well. But not all of these large birds were actually plant eaters. There were some of them that were clearly terrors. And these birds, called the terror birds, are the for forest rushes, and they were abundantly known in South America. There are huge numbers of fossils. Last year I was in Argentina actually looking at some of these birds, and they have a lot of material of these birds. And one of the most distinctive feature about them is the way in which they burk, their beak, sorry, beak curves down into this pointy structure. Okay, so basically a very good beak for a predator to have. And these birds, we certainly think, were the top predators in the Cenozoic era. And they were dominant in the Cenozoic. And until the uh, connection between North America and South America was established, which is considered to be about maybe 10 million years ago, and the height of the movement of the animals across North America and South America is called the Great North American Exchange. It's when animals from South America and North America were able to cross the two continents because of the land connection between them, the Ishmus connection. When that connection was made, you found there was migration across the two continents. And these birds were in South America. There were many of them known. One of them, we know, established itself in North America, but goes extinct. But all these birds in South America go extinct because the large predators from uh, North America moved into South America and completely outcompeted them. So they go extinct because of competition. And it's really fascinating to see that um, also the one that made it across, for a very short time it established itself and it goes extinct also. It's all unable to compete with the um, uh, mammalian uh, predators of the time. So this particular one is the largest of the forest rushes. It's called um, Kalen Ken. And we find its fossil, um, uh, fossil remains in, uh, in the uh, geological record that dates to about 15 million years ago. And it probably stood between two and three meters. It was a fairly tall bird, so very good height. And from the skeletal remains, we know that this, the tibia part of the skeleton was about 45 centimeters. Its skull was very long, about 71 centimeters from the back of the skull to the tip of the snout. And just the, the part that sticks out, like the, the beak part, was about 45 centimeters. Just the beak alone, so very big probing beak as well. And quite a heavy bird. But more lightly built than we've seen in Apionus or than the Dromonathids. So definitely a bird adapted for more agility. What about the New Zealand fauna? So most um, young people grow up hearing about the moa when they, when they see the big bird of Sesame Street. I'm sure some of you as parents or grandparents know about the Sesame Street bird. And we think that that bird is actually based on the moa from New Zealand. And this group of birds, there are many of them, there's a whole range of these different birds. And we see that they were many different sizes of them. They were very large birds. They had these long necks, so like an ostrich, long necks. And they had a beak a little bit curved, so not uh, birds that were eating the tough vegetation like we see in the Australian group. So they were also uh, herbivores. And we know that the largest of them, Dinonus robustus, is actually 
quite tall, about 3.6 meters tall, but not as heavy as the Dromonithids or the Apionis. Okay, so only about 230 kilograms. And what was interesting when the researchers began working on these birds, they found there was clearly some sexual dimorphism. So there were certainly some bones that look bigger and some bones that look smaller, even though they had the same proportions and they looked the same. So they were looking like they were a sexual dimorphic species. And sure enough, when they did the analysis, they found out that the, um, the larger of them was the female of the species, and the smaller ones were the males, so the females were the ones that were larger. And they also were able to, um, to do analysis to understand how these different birds were related to one another. So there's an interesting um, study that allowed the analysis of these birds. So these are very fascinating new work done on these birds. And we know also from some of the um, fossil evidence that they had this kind of reddish um, furry um, uh, structures. The feathers were not like a modern bird flying feathers. They become more tough-like and more like um, springy, so like hair-like structures rather than feathers of birds that fly. But on the island in New Zealand, there was another big bird. And this bird, we think, preyed on the moa. And this was the Haas eagle. And this was a fairly large bird, also sexually dimorphic, like many of the birds of prey, that the females were larger than the males, and quite a vicious bird, a wingspan of about eight to 10 feet, so fairly big. And we think that it went extinct when the moa actually goes extinct. So what is interesting from the fossil record is that you can find moa fossils up to about 40,000 years ago. So again, very, very recently, they went extinct. And we think that they basically were hunted out by Polynesian settlers, and they were extinct by the, by the 1500s. So not long ago, really completely extinct by about the 1500s. So other big birds that um, were around, and these are much more deeper in time. This is a Cretaceous bird called Gastornis. And we know about 70 million years ago, so you also probably know that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, and soon thereafter we see the radiation of these very big birds. So basically, a vacant niche opened up, and we see this big size development. And this is another uh, bird. This is the skull of uh, one of these uh, Gastornis. And we find it between, uh, in a variety of places, North America, Europe, Asia. And it dates to about 55 to 40 million years ago. And the question most of you are probably wondering is, why did these birds become so big? And it's, it's been something that uh, researchers, biologists, have been fascinated about. Because even if you look at modern islands, and if you look at the fauna on modern islands and compare that fauna that is present on the islands with that of the mainlands, you see that there's always a change in body size. And the changes could go two ways. You could have a big elephant becoming a dwarf. So I'm sure you've all heard of the dwarf elephants. Okay, they were only about this high, and their babies were about that high. I mean, I have a student who's working on uh, dwarf elephants from Sicily, and they really are exactly like elephants, but they've just shrunk in size. And among the elephants themselves, there are some that are very small, the falconeri are very small, but there are others that are medium-sized, and we see that from a big body size, moving to an island, they shrink. And we've seen also the opposite effect, that small body size animals sometimes become very large on an island. And the person who began all this research was Foster. And today, this island rule, or Foster's rule, 
is really comes from his research where he looked at both island and mainland species and he saw this trend of things becoming that are large becoming smaller and things that are small becoming bigger. And this is today framed as the island rule. And we know that today it seems that depending on the resources available on the island, it will dictate which direction that body size movement actually occurs. So it either the animal becomes um, smaller or it becomes bigger. In the case of the elephants, of course, on a small island, the resources are limited, so they become smaller. But there's several advantages of actually being big on an island. We see that you could have um, a larger species. It would be able to dominate a bigger niche area. So ecologically, it would be able to establish itself firmer in that uh, environment. It would be able to move greater distances. And usually, in the absence of large predators, we see that birds and reptiles tend to take over those niches. Among herbivores, we know that large size also allows them to, um, to cope with predators. So being big on, in, on the island of New Zealand would have enabled the moa to kind of not be such easy prey for the harsh eagle. But one of the things that we've been fascinated about, and this is my team that I work with, is how does life history changes? What are the changes associated with becoming big? And in a bird, what kinds of changes can we actually see? And so this is what tomorrow's lecture will be, is particularly fo focusing on the dromornis. And I'll talk to you about what we've been able to find out about the life history of these big birds. And then lastly, I wanted to just let you know that I have a new course beginning on uh, Future Learn. I'm not sure how many of you have participated on the uh, UCT online courses. And this is something that's a free course. I think you have pamphlets that we asked them to distribute some pamphlets. So it's a free course, and it really uh, allows us to talk to a much, much wider audience about, um, in my case, about extinctions. And so the course was only um, be beginning to be advertised since last week, and already there are about 250 participants worldwide. So it's really quite amazing because I just love seeing it. I mean, you open up these um, the, the Future Learn platform, and I don't know if you can see it, but I can immediately see who's registering for the course. And you open up, and you have a global map, and it shows you who's signing up for the course. And it's just amazing. So after one week, already there's 250 people, and I think it's really going to go up. The course is only going to start on the 20th of March, so there's still time to register. And it's really very popular level. So it's a short lectures, there are little videos, there are interviews with scientists. There's a whole series of uh, visits to different places. We go to the fossil park, we go to the museum, we go to Table Mountain, and we do all kinds of interesting things that I, I just sometimes wish we could do in a book because, you know, some of you know my Fossils for Africa book, and when I did that book, I so much wanted to do um, like to have these videos and things that go with it, and I wasn't able to do that. But now I have this wonderful opportunity, and it's been a lot of work, but I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun also. So I hope you will sign up and enjoy it. Anyway, I'm happy to take questions about the lecture, so please um, feel free to ask. Um, not a month or two, but I have worked on uh, Chinese birds and Chinese dinosaurs. So not Mongolian, but Chinese. Yes? Um, 
Well, you know, in, in, when we look at um, these birds, we have to certainly try and understand what would have been the advantage of being large. So maybe in their particular environment, being large females, they would have been able to protect their eggs better. Maybe they would be able to um, offer more protection to the young. Just a larger body size may have been an advantage. So it's always debatable about what does a large size confer. You know, so when we think about ostriches, we know that ostriches, the males are very large. But amongst ostriches, we know that the females all deposit their eggs in a nest. And more often, the responsibility of looking after the young is usually the males. Let me go to my second question. For that bird, I was imagining this little male needing a stepladder. For that very large bird that you showed, no feathers. Are there cases like that that seems most unusual? No, no, not, fe not featherless. It would have had feathers, but the feathers are not adapted for flight. They've become very springly, hair-like structures. So, you know, the feathers are completely useless for flight now, so they don't need to be like a modern feather that's aerod aerodynamically designed. Sorry? <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I didn't understand. You said the pterosaur must have had, yeah? As a bird, it is the, um, it's not the largest, that it's probably a larger, large for a bird, the largest for birds, but not the largest for pterosaur. The pterosaurs, there were certainly others that were also big-winged. Okay, so it's not second as in, uh, sorry, I may have confused you there. I, I meant as a group, the, the um, Sanderacy has a very large wingspan, but the largest actually was among the pterosaurs. A flying reptile, so their wings were not made of feathers, their wings were made of membrane. So they are the flying reptiles. Yeah, they were quite amazing creatures, actually. Yes? The feather birds, amongst them, they some that have four legs. No, they shouldn't have four legs. Uh, no, it's just the, the way they, they, they fall limbs, but they're not really legs. They don't actually reach the ground. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. So, so just like an like a, like, um, ostrich, it has its four limbs. It makes up its wings, but it doesn't actually use them. So they're like um, vestigial. They're small, but they don't actually use those limbs. They, they're part of their skeleton. And if you look at the, at the wing, it's just a wing, but not functional for flight. So it basically is the forelimb. That's what the forelimb is. Yeah, but like, it's like a T-Rex, you know, having arms but not really using them. So vestigial, we think. It's very difficult to use these arms if you're so big. How would you get down to your prey? At least with T-Rex, we think it may have, maybe use them for scavenging, helping with scavenging, but we don't really know. That's an interesting question. So if we, if we have to now take a, a step back. So birds are mammals. Uh, birds are endothermic, and so are mammals. And we are mammals. So we have endothermy, which allows us a high rate of metabolism. Dinosaurs are somewhere in between. We don't think they were warm-blooded or endotherms, 
neither were they exactly ectotherms. And when we look at the bones of dinosaurs and look at birds and mammals, we see that there's interesting things that happen in their bone structures themselves. So at a microscopic level, we can see the same basic structures. So you will find the bone cells, you will find blood vessels that course through the bone, but what's different in a mammal, that's us, and in a bird that is also a warm-blooded animal, the way in which these tissues are organized is very different. So in mammals and birds, we find that they have an extremely fast rate of growth, and this manifests in the bone in terms of how the bone is actually formed. So they have many more what we call primary osteons. They have uh, more woven textured bone. And all of this is because they have fast rates of growth. Dinosaurs, on the other hand, they tend to have um, a longer um, rate of growth, a slower rate of growth, and we find that they don't have the vascularization to the same extent as do mammals and birds. And they also have growth lines. But tomorrow, I'm going to tell you about these birds and what we see under the microscope with their bones. So watch the space. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.